So hello everyone. Um, thank you for being with us today. I'm Miriam, the Deputy Director of Albertin Books, and uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to welcome today French novelist Alice Zeniter and literary critic Danit Stephens to celebrate the US release of Alice's novel, The Art of Losing, published by FSG. And first, we would like to thank Lodge and Shivers for her instrumental help in organizing this event. By all means, The Art of Losing is a remarkable novel which received many literary awards in France and was acclaimed, one of the reasons this novel was acclaimed is beside its literary achievement, it, because it's, it is one of the first fiction to embrace the stories of Harkis and to break the silence that usually surrounded these stories. So let me now introduce our guest. We are extremely grateful to Danny Stephens for accepting our invitation to moderate this conversation. Danny has covered books and authors at Entertainment Weekly, Time Europe, Time Out New York, Time Out London, The Independent and Scotland and Sunday. She currently co contributes to the Boston Globe, Lit Hub, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. Alice Zeniter is a French novelist, a translator, script writer, script writer sorry, and director. Her novel, Takes This Man, was published in English by Europa Edition in 2011. Zeniter has won many awards for her work in France, including Le Prix Littéraire de la Porte Dorée, the Prix Renaudot des Lycéens and Le Prix Goncourt des Lycéens, which is one of the most prestigious, prestigious literary awards. And she was awarded to uh, all these, uh, um, Le Prix Goncourt des Lycéens was awarded to The Art of Losing. Alice lives in between Brittany and Paris. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor to our guest and wish you a lovely conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's just get started, Alice. Um, I wanted to ask you first, uh, there are other novels um, in this vein where someone in our contemporary generation goes on a kind of odyssey or discovery to explore their family's history and heritage um, through fiction. Um, and quite often the focus is on that contemporary person, the narrator, as they get glimpses of the backstory and learn more about their family history through that lens. I really enjoyed in your book being fully immersed in Ali's world, the grandparents' generation. Um, and that was sort of the larger part of the book, um, at least to begin with, I felt. And I wonder how you made the decision to focus so generously on his time and place in particular, and then moving along to his son Hamid in Algeria and in France, and then on to Naima's life and world, the granddaughter. Actually, it took me um, it took me a while because uh, my, my first instinct was to write the book through Naima's eyes and through her quest of uh, of uh, discovering the the family stories. But um, after trying a few things, so I, I tried uh, writing it with a, a first person uh, Naima, then a third person uh, Naima, and then I realized that. Um, it didn't matter the, the first or the third person. My problem was that I was kind of um, crushing uh, Ali's story and Amid's uh, story. Like um, uh, I, I, I could make them appear only through the eyes of Naima and uh, her, uh, you know, her prejudices or her modern way of seeing the the world, um, and. I think like I started to, to, to really uh, uh, want to change the narration system when I thought, you know, um, like, is it possible for Naima to understand what it means to live a life without knowing how to read and write? Uh, and I don't, I don't think she will take the time to make this, uh, this jump. Uh, like she can have empathy, she can, you know, understand things, she can write on dates. But uh, will she take the time to project herself in this uh, different way of, uh, of living? And I wasn't sure of that, so I decided that I would, uh, I would take it. I would take, yeah, a great amount of time building a character that was so different from me, and I would give it the lead part, 
uh, in his part of the of the novel. It's wonderful. You really let his story breathe, and the the story of the bigger story of the family. Um, I wonder also. Um, I know this is a this is probably a mix. I mean, it's a novel, so it's it's fiction. But what what was the starting point of this book for you, or what was the what was the first impetus that made you want to sit down and start telling this story? Mm. I had several um, um, several signs, maybe, if I can use that without sounding too mystical, but several signs that maybe it was like, um, it was time. Uh, so first I have to say that like for my 20s, I started to get interested in, uh, in the Algerian history in a way I had um, never done before. Like before that, I was kind of sure that, you know, something should uh, should come to me from Algeria. It had to be from my family. I rejected the other channels. So I never read uh, history books. I never watched Algerian movies or, or read Algerian writers. You know, I, I was like uh, uh, waiting it all to come from one channel, my parents or maybe my grandmother. And uh, and later in my 20s, I, uh, I realized I, I could choose uh, other people to uh, to uh, to pass me the the story, um, so uh, I started to read books, to watch movies, and and all that, uh, and uh, and then then I real uh, I remember that at some point I was in a in a small village in uh, in Normandy, uh, writing for a couple of months, and uh, this old man came by and he gave me a book of poetry that he had written when he was younger, and he, he didn't tell me uh at all what it was about and when i flipped through it i realized that it was his um like it was actually uh a, um a diary in verse of his time in algeria during the war um and i don't know i i felt it very weird that this man had the idea to give me this book because he didn't know that i was half algerian half french so it was like this this story you know made its way uh to, to me and then uh, and then a couple of years later I read this book by uh, Nicole Lapierre uh, which is called Sauf qui peut la vie and uh, and at the end of the, the book she's talking about uh, actual mi migrants mm -hmm. and uh, and she said no one is telling their story in the right way that we should tell their story in the way Homer uh, told the, uh, the, the Odysseus uh, because they are like Ulysses, they they they, they have the same they have the same uh, intelligence, uh, you know, the like capacity of re reacting, adapting, changing, and it's the same story of a never-ending journey. Like you think you will go on the boat and arrive somewhere, but actually it takes you years because you you are never really arrived. You are never totally French. You so so the journey is is sometimes like a, a, as long as your life is and your children's life and then suddenly your third generation can say wow i'm french um and uh, and i loved this um this idea of uh, uh of telling a migrant story like uh, like uh, ulysses uh because it had you know like it it spoke to my uh, to my writer side not just the daughter of an immigrant one i was like oh so this is a kind of a literary tour de force as well to uh, to take a situation that we see with a uh, you know at best pity uh commiseration and pity and then and to say like no we should admire that uh it takes a lot of strength and patience and and, uh, and all of that so yeah so i decided that i could try but i was sure that i would try now and then it would take me 10 years you know or maybe more like i thought it was a book that i will publish in my 50s when i would be like a uh, <laughs> a fully grown-up writer and yeah to my uh, big surprise when i sat down at the table and started writing it just came pouring uh, and, uh, and I spent two years doing it. it never stopped. Wow. So the, you kind of, the story kind of ran away with you. Yeah. Surprise. That's wonderful. 
Um, there's also, I mean, you, you, you incorporate some extraordinary details into this book. I mean, from life in Kabylia, as well as the transitory, the migrant camps and, and housing projects for Algerians in France. Um, I'm thinking of details like the, you know, Ali's first wife, whom he wouldn't fix a diary upon, a, a dowry upon, and therefore she could never marry again. I mean, it, that sort of impact. Um, I'm thinking about the predatory salespeople in France who come to the apartments and try to sell to the Algerian, the, the Algerians, and and the red bunny suit that Kader loves in the in the camp. Um, you mentioned in, a, in another interview that. Uh, there's a particular event in Ali's life where he's at a bar and you mentioned that you got that story from another person that you met in Toronto. Um, so I'm wondering where where your most of your the salient research came from. It seems like it's a really strong mix of archival research, family history, and then getting others to share their own stories. Um, and then I'm wondering how you made the choices um, of which pieces to include in your novel. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, th the research part was uh, uh, was fun because actually it wasn't really a part of the writing. At first, I thought you know like I could focus on the research and then I would I would do the the writing. But some just um, uh, just transf transform themselves in front of my eyes like I was uh, I was reading something very very factual very uh, uh, you know like numbers this percentage of people would do that and that and and, and suddenly uh, suddenly I was thinking oh I could use that like um, I could turn it into uh, into like a, a, a detail for this character uh, and so I would like put down the history book or sociology book and and, and start writing the the novel and, and jump from one to the other a lot. Uh, I think my biggest problem was uh, that if I wanted to try to, um, if I wanted to, to try to learn about Kabylie before the French colonization uh, arrived and decided like they will, they will modernize the way they, uh, they cultivate the fields and the, the olive trees and uh, so uh, to find the traditional uh, ways of life. I really had to uh, to work on on old French archives, like like uh, you know stories by the the first one who climbed the mountains of Kabylie, and and they are called them racists. It's it's awful. So you know, like the only source that I could have, I, I needed like I needed to be very cautious with it because um, they give me precious details about I don't know about flowers, trees, uh, housings, buildings, uh, th this kind of things, but at the same time. Uh, they keep saying that the villagers they're like children you know like uh, they have the intelligence of an eight years old uh, children except when it comes to the money because uh, they're, they're greedy like yeah you know and so it's it's very weird to work on this uh, uh, specific type of uh, of documents um but yeah i uh, i did it anyway and and yeah, I I, uh, I also took things from uh, uh, from conversations with uh, with people, and sometimes it's just like one sentences, you know, like uh, one sentence. It's like uh, uh, something that I like, like like for example, I can hear that this sentence it's uh, it's Arabic or Kabyle translated into French, but it keeps the the prints of the the, the first language. And uh, I feel like, oh yeah, I really like that, you know, and, and to try to extend it and to create characters sometimes with just that, like a, a fr from, from a very short conversation with someone and, and because I just yeah, kept one sentence. Uh, so yeah, I had multiple sources. That's wonderful, yeah. No, it comes through, I mean, the, the rhythm, each, each of the characters and not just the major ones, but some of the peripheral characters are very fully formed. Um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, you, the plot line with y Youssef, um, who is in the who's in the village and who's kept in childhood by poverty. I mean, a really yeah. uh, impactful phrase. Um, and it, you mentioned also it's a country where there's no adolescence, um, that there's a sudden shift from childhood to adulthood. I mean, that was just the reality of life then. Um, so a strong element of this book is showing life under French colonialism and it's and the brutality of it, the harshness of it. 
but your book also doesn't shy away from the fact of you know what continues uh, after post-war, after po post-colonialism, that the end of war um, and and shifts in countries sometimes just means the beginning of and of an accounting of retribution, of revenge, and ongoing displacement. Um, and your book is also open-ended in this way, which I found really refreshing. It's not just like a everything is resolved. Um, so I can see you see this story is ongoing. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about that a bit in terms of what you see around you in France and the world today. Hmm. Um, that things yeah. are, really, it doesn't, you know, colonial doesn't, colonialism doesn't end with the end of colonialism. Um, the, the shifts, the displacements don't end once you get to a new country. There's still a, there's still a, it's, it's an ongoing story. Yeah, so first, uh, <laughs> uh, I could I could answer this question for hours and hours, I think, uh, because uh, uh, because it could be answered on so many levels. Uh, so first, that what we see today in the way we look at um, at immigrants, it's a hierarchy of culture, uh, because when they arrive in France, the way they're uh, looked upon, it's that they don't do things in the proper ways. Uh, they lack that or they, they do that too much. Um, but it's actually very difficult uh, to picture them with a culture on their own that is equal to ours. Um, and it's what I was uh, actually trying to, to do when I wrote The Art of Losing, to like to to give the reader uh, such a strong experience of what was life in Algeria that they they would uh, they, they would forget a bit that uh, that the way we live in France it's not that obvious you know that uh, uh, if you have different way of talking different uh, rules of politeness different way of organizing yourself of thinking about justice uh, what um, how a clan works. Uh, th then suddenly the French way to do things, the occidental French way to do things will look weird. You're saying, like, why do they do that? And I wanted a French reader to be able to think that about France, you know, to, uh, to make this, this step. So, um, so they can see as well this hierarchy of culture that we still, uh, we still have in mind when we, we look at, at, at immigrants here. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, there is the problem of um, uh, police brutality, because, uh, because the, the, the violent acts uh, of uh, policemen against Black or, or Arab men here in, uh, in France, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, they, they, uh, you have that in the United States as, as well, but uh, the, the French story, history of, uh, of violent police against uh, Black and Arabs, it's, uh, it's throated in the colonial times, where officially the police had two different ways of treating, you know, white people and Arab or Black, like the indigenous, and even on the metropolitan territory, uh, they, they were treating the, the two populations um, in, in different ways. And uh, so we have a history of racial injustice and it's not, you, you cannot say that it's the bias of one individual or not, like the police was uh, functioning on this colonial um, system for, for decades. And, uh, and so of course, like it didn't disappear like that after a few wars of independence, it's still, uh, it's still in the system. So we have to, to think that we have to face it uh, and, uh, and to address it, uh, obviously. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and then you have the, this um, war, of, um, uh, war of memories that still goes on here in France as well, that it's actually very hard for um, some of the, the communities to hear uh, the, the memories of another one. So, for example, if uh, the Algerian says, like, you know, that the French army was very brutal, you have, like, the Pied Noir uh, community who will say, like, yeah, but what about uh, Oran uh, in the 50s, like, uh, your guys massacred us, and, and it's always a competition. Uh, and, and, and the coexistence of several memories, it's still a very, a very hard thing. 
uh, and then of course that will be my last point like uh, the, we still do the same thing as a nation with the camps that uh, that they did in in the 60s so we have camps built for the migrants they're outside of the cities they are you know like far away from the eyes far away from the thoughts so like most of the people can go on with without thinking of uh, of migrants like one second in their day and um and that's terrible because i realized you know when when i wrote the art of losing people would come and tell me like oh my god i didn't know i had never heard of it and, and yeah actually everything was made so you didn't hear uh, about it and we are re uh, making the same mistake right now we are keeping the situation away uh yeah treating it like some just like a it's an eyesore it has to be you know like a, it has to be kept away and that means that in 50 years like uh, we will wake up or, or or children will wake up saying my god it was a crime against humanity uh how could we do that yeah but we are still redoing it um in i have a question about naima now sorry um so it, it ali's first wife um who gives him two daughters which is a uh, terrible disappointment i mean this line was almost like magic realism the family is so disgusted that the, the poor mother promptly dies of shame as soon as she's given birth to the second daughter um and then in france we have this very telling scene with yema and her neighbor uh they're making baklava for the neighbor's daughter's wedding uh they both come with their families from algeria but they have this very brief um but telling conversation about how they actually didn't want to leave and it's just the men are dragging them there and the men have lost the country um and if they'd had the chance they would have stayed in algeria um and naima in your book is a woman who is um creating her own agency she's in the process of creating her own agency setting the the direction of her own life and i wondered if it was a deliberate choice to make her a granddaughter rather than a grandson yeah, I wanted to, uh, um, even if, so, you know, you can say that the first part of the book is about Ali and the second one is about Hamid. Uh, I wanted as well to have three generations of women and, mm -hmm. uh, and this incredible change of, uh, of situation because, uh, you know, like Yema is married when she's still a kid, she has never met her husband she has never met Ali before uh, they, they got married then she is kept in the um, uh, domestic area so no one will ask her uh, her opinion about politics the war or, or even you know like uh, what does she prefer like to stay in Algeria and take the risk of uh, um, of being killed or going like it's it's a sure thing that she will follow her husband she is her possession yeah. uh, and then you have uh, Clarice, Naima's mother, with this woman, you know, like from the, the 70s, uh, with, uh, with um, yeah, uh, like uh, uh, the dreams of her time, but still is, uh, is uh, taken in a, in, a, in a pattern, you know, like uh, that is very classical, like, you know, like uh, she, she wants to meet a man, to fall in love and to have kids, and she, she will have uh, four, four daughters. And then, uh, uh, Naima never got married. Naima like uh, doesn't have uh, doesn't have kids. She uh, she thinks about um, like her work, her friendships, and uh, and all of that. So so it's really quite a change in in such a small time. Like these three women can stand in the same kitchen and yeah. talk together. Like you know, it's not centuries away from uh, from each other. They they can share the same room but they didn't share the same experience of what it meant to be a, a woman and i really wanted to write about it and i wanted as well to uh, to show that uh, uh it's it's not you know like a, it's not just a line of progress which is simple and uh, and only going forward like when naima goes to algeria she she learns about it as well that you can lose rights that he can go backwards, that it can regress, and that it's something, uh, it's something you have to fight for. You cannot, you know, say just like you know, there was Yema, Clarisse, me, and so of course the next generation will be freer than I was because it's the way things go. No, if you don't fight for these things, they disappear. 
Yeah, you had a lovely line. It's actually earlier in the book, but you talk about Naima representing the second generation of North African immigration in France. And you have this phrase as though immigration were a never ending process, as though she were still migrating. And you make that, that point comes through. I mean, it runs through the whole book and all the way through till the end, um, which is kind of not really an end. It's a, it's a continuation. Um, but beyond the book, do you have a vision of Naima's story and how it might continue? No. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. No, I have, uh, uh, I don't know, it's not, a, it's not even a rule, it's how it works for me, but uh, in the same time, I want to have an open end, mm -hmm. uh, like I don't like this false, um, uh, this false resolutions, you know, like to say, and the story is done and it's done for good. Like, yeah. uh, like, you know, she will be happy forever and ever after, or, or sad forever and ever after. Uh, so to, to leave things open, but the fact that I leave things open, it doesn't mean that I, that I can um, uh, imagine further. You know, like after the last page of the book, you and I, we are equal. Uh, if you want to imagine something about Naima, you will be as right as, as I am. Like, it's not the book anymore. Cool. And you mentioned in your acknowledgments your own visits to Algeria. And I wonder, um, when did you first go there? At what age you first went there and what those visits were like? And was there something in particular about your experiences there that you've incorporated into the art of losing? I'm sure there's lots, but yeah. the more, you know, the really things that really struck you that, that you wanted to include in the book or that you ended up including in the book. Mm. So I went there for the first time uh, in um, 2011, I think. Uh, so I was uh, I was in my mid twenties, um, and uh, and and then I went back in 2013. And yeah, I used a lot of, of my uh, uh, of my travels for the book, which is which was like really weird because I never went there thinking that I was going there. Uh, in order to write a novel about it. I went there because I wanted to see the country. Um, and and yeah, and then when I started to write The Art of Losing, I just uh, went back to my uh, to my notes and my notebooks and, uh, and I thought like, uh, oh, thank God I did these trips because otherwise I don't know how I could have written about Kabylie. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, one of the most uh, uh, striking thing was uh, uh so my uh, my father's village like uh, like uh, amid's village uh they're in unsafe zones uh in algeria they're in the mountains and you still have uh terrorists up there so it was really dangerous to go uh, and i didn't plan to go uh, in the first trip, I didn't did it, and the second trip, I didn't plan to go there, and I ended up going there just on kind of a of a of a whim or or, or out of bravado because someone said, "Oh no, it's not dangerous," and I go there tomorrow. I take you, uh, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, "Oh yeah, um, uh, okay then," uh, and uh, and then I I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to 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 back out of my world so you know I was how oh, this guy is, is gonna wake up tomorrow morning and come and pick me up I, I have to go uh, and this thing of going to see your um, you know like the village of your ancestors yeah. but you didn't plan it at all it has nothing of um, uh, of the solemnity mm -hmm. uh, that you, you think it will have it's just like it just happens and uh, and you keep thinking like oh I don't know exactly where, where I'm going I didn't uh, um, you know, I didn't tell anyone. Uh, I, I don't know who I, am I looking for, what kind of building. It's, it's just like, it's not supposed to happen this way. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and I wanted to, to describe it, this, this completely yeah, unplanned uh, discovering of my, my family there. Did you find some connections there for, on, on, for yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a lot like uh, like uh, like my my story in the book, Beautiful. and with this incredibly rude thing, you know, that that I suddenly met my family, but because it wasn't planned, I had no presence. Like I showed up on top on top of the mountains empty-handed, yeah. uh, which makes me like the worst niece or cousin or whatever you can think about. 
That's funny. Yeah, that was a lovely detail. But at least she recognized, at least she knew that that was an issue, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like she was horrified. Um, and in, in the art of losing, now that you, you mentioned something at the beginning, there's an anonymous narrator who pops up just every once in a while, a little bit at the beginning and a couple of other times and then towards the end. Um, was that just a, a vestige of when you were doing it, when you were sort of the major narrator or no? Who's so no, it's my own. It, infrequent it's my own. assistant narrator. <laughs> it's my master of puppets uh, oh, right. side. Because uh, I, I really, uh, no, I, I had this thing very clear in my mind that I wanted, uh, uh, so I, I knew that I was, uh, uh, I was dealing with uh, uh, family stories material, but in, uh, in the same time, I knew as well that I didn't want to make it just like some memoirs about my, uh, my family or some, uh, something like touching only my situation. And I wanted it, uh, I wanted it to be a, 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 a real piece of, uh, of fiction. I wanted it to be, and, and a big chunky novel and, uh, you know, like a, um, with its way of being built. And, and I think this is why this uh, I, the writer, uh, came in because I, I was, you know, I, I wanted to say like, if I write that, if I'm able to write that, it's not because I'm the daughter of who I am and the granddaughter of who I am. It's, it's actually because I'm a writer. Like I know things that Naima doesn't know. I uh, and I will pass you information that she will never have. Therefore, like you're actually a lucky reader uh, because you can uh, you can understand everything. And this it's done because uh, because this is a piece of writing. Uh, you know, like I wasn't uh, I wasn't born and raised in this knowledge about the story or you know like I chose a very uh, a very peculiar way of uh, doing my research and of telling my story. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a piece of writing. That's wonderful. And, and what does it mean to you with this book to be recognized um, with the special Don Cole prize that's, that's honored, uh, that's given from high school students? It was very moving um, because the, um, so the, the the novel you know like spreads through three generations and of course i naima's generation like the book ends with me my generation and uh, and these high schoolers they're the next one uh, and i didn't i didn't think about them when uh, when i was writing like somehow maybe it's my foolishness i, I still see myself as, as a as a young one <laughs> and uh, and i i never uh, think about actual youngsters um but yeah i didn't think about about them i thought about the three generation that are talked about in my novel and then suddenly this award came to tell me that the book expanded to a fourth generation a generation i i hadn't planned but that they they could give uh, they, they could be given this story now and do whatever they they, they want with it but it was passed on uh, uh after me and uh yeah and it was really really touching to uh, uh to to see that and of course like in in the high schoolers that i've met uh a lot of them came from a uh, um immigrant family so you know from different parts of the world but uh but it, you know it moved things in them as well to read the books you know so like suddenly they were telling me like i need to Go and speak to my grandparents before uh, before they die, before they disappear, because I don't really know why we're here. <laughs> you know, like uh, I know that we came from this country, but why uh, are we in this uh, French town or this French village and not in another one? Why, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, like uh, something was uh, traveling through the the whole of us and the and the multiple generations. That's great. Um, you talked earlier about how easily, I mean, you thought this book would take a long time, but in the end, you sort of wrote it over two years, much, much more quickly than you expected. Was there, what was the most challenging part of writing this book, if there was one? Mm. I think, um, I, I think what helped me to uh, uh, to write so easily, it's the fact that the, the three different parts they don't demand the same things. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they, they don't, uh, uh, they don't provide the same obstacles. Like the first one, what was really hard was, uh, so first to have, uh, to have enough knowledge to know the little details, because otherwise I would be stopped at every sentence, you know, like I, I, I would want to write a, um, a scene where they're eating and then suddenly I'm like, oh, but what are they eating in? Or, you know, like, is it possible that they have this object or this thing and this? And so it's always, yeah, it's always being stopped. And then you take one book and then you, uh, so th that was one of the problem. And, and the other one was to, what do I do with the kind of a folklore thing, like uh, the, the exotic uh, side of it, like, uh, because I can't, I, I can't hide the fact that, yes, there is an exotism in it that appeals to me, like, you know, that this word, like, I've never used it before in a novel, I want to use it because it's foreign and it's new and it's, uh, but, but it's not foreign and new and exotic for my characters. It's not like a piece of, uh, of, of jewelry uh, in, in the language. It's, it's their everyday, uh, it's their everyday experience. So that, that need to be um, fought against. And, uh, and then in the, in the second one, it was, um, I think, I think I, I had to fight against the fact that I really felt that Amid and Clarice, the, they are my parents in a way. So, you know, Ali is, I, I could imagine because I knew so little about him, but Amin and Clarice, I know my parents. So it was something like, you know, I really had to choose, do I want to take uh, this true event or do I want to make one up? And if I make this one up, what does it say about my parents? And so, uh, and so on and so on. And then the third one, basically the obstacle was, it's my everyday life, uh, it looks boring. How can I make it, you know, the same experience that the that the two first parts? Like I I know that you know like uh, I, I I I yeah I know that like the back of my hands uh, and uh, there is no novel material in it. It's just like being in Paris, blah blah blah. Uh, the everyday racism, uh, how to live after the attacks. It's uh, actually yeah, it's even suffocating how it's uh, the paste my life is made of. How can I turn it into a, a narration? And so when I just was, you know, like too much fed up with one of these problem, I could swift, I, I could, you know, like jump from one part to the other one saying, okay, I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna bother with that anymore. Okay. I, and, and it was like starting, starting the writing anew, like uh, starting a new day of writing because the, the, the rules were so different. Nice. So you kept it fresh for yourself. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Um, you, you originally published your first book when you were 16. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering now, um, how, how do you see your trajectory as a writer in the, in the years since then? What, and what have you learned about yourself or about your writing? You've, you've, you, you, you write in several different mediums now. Um, so I just wonder, you know, looking back, what you see as your own trajectory as a writer. Mm. Or is it too soon perhaps? <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I think it's a it's a hard question, um, and uh, and it's still uh, of course it's it's still changing. Sure. Um, so I think like I, I I'm able to recognize now certain patterns that never left me, and to think like even when I think I'm writing about something else, I'm always writing about. Uh, identities, what it means to be you, like how, uh, how were you built by, uh, you know, by your country, by your family, by different groups, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and what kind of fiction do you tell yourself about, uh, about yourself? Um, these kind of things, it always comes back, so even when I write a book for children and it's about animals dancing in the forest, in the end, you know, you have a bear saying like, what does it mean to be a bear? What is the essence of a bear? Uh, can I be a bear if I am vegetarian? I don't know, maybe I should kill a, a rabbit to be really a bear, and all this thing. I'm like, oh, oh, they're always the same questions. I can't escape myself. Um, and, um, and I think I learned as well uh, uh, that sometimes, I don't know, like uh, 
that, that my, my writing needs goes through uh, some levels mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes like I, I can feel that I gained um, yeah I gained qualities that I didn't have um, and uh, and it's it's amazing like uh, it's like it's like being more uh, more supple and stronger it's like you know doing your gym exercise in the morning and suddenly you can touch your feet yeah uh, yeah and yeah. it's 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 crazy, but sometimes I, you know, I stay for years on the same on the same plateau, and I have to remind myself that it's uh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. You cannot be climbing a mountain every day. Uh, so so yeah, I see my uh, my writing life as something like that, nice. but more or less always focusing around the same questions around identity. Yeah, and. You write in different um, in different formats. I mean, you've also worked as a translator, but you write for screen. You've written for screen. You've written novels. Um, are you more comfortable in a particular um, area, or do they each give you something different? Do you get something different from each of those? I think I think I, I love them all, and I'm uh, and I'm at home. Um, in uh, in every uh, every single type of writing that I'm doing, but uh, this being said, the novel has some kind of uh, uh, some kind of a uh, it's it's some way it's it's more I don't know uh, it's more obvious because it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have um, an economy that goes against the writing. If I write a play, then I will have to think like, how do I direct it? And if there is 15 characters, it will cost so much. And if there is uh, 50 sets, uh, settings, and then, you know, like it will have this cost as well. It's the same thing if I write for a movie and then, you know, like I want to put that and that and then in the scenario and then you have someone telling you like, no, if it's more than two hours, it won't be screened in theaters because, you know, you will lose some of the, um, uh, some of the seance of the days. And, uh, uh, and, and so finally, yeah, I, eventually the, the writing, is controlled by things that have nothing to do with the writing, yeah. um, and uh, and that is something that I can you know dislike, and uh, and that in the end, like uh, I go back to the novel where I can do everything I want, and uh, and then you know it's between me and the and the readership. Uh, if if they don't like it, okay, you know, like maybe I put it too far. The book is too long, uh, or the, the the plot is too loose, and that. But but I chose to do that, and uh, and none of us, you know, uh, no one uh, came up while I was writing, telling me like, no, it will cost us too much money. Just you know, cut that, cut this chapter. About no limits, no boundaries. Yes. Um, in there's a really poignant moment in your book where Hamid is a. Uh, as a child, he witnesses the fact, he suddenly realizes that his parents are completely illiterate. They can't even sign their own names. And I love there's a, there's a, a connectivity with later Naima really finds fascinating the fact that Hamid will give the same attention and respect to any text, whether it's a newspaper column or a book or even an advertisement. I mean, that's how important literacy has become to him. Um, and I, I mean, obviously, this this is part of the book as well. But you know, what do you think it is about literacy, or even about literature, that really gives us freedom or free agency, at least? Why is it so important? Well, I think you know that it's um uh, when when you write it, it's uh, it's a privilege to be able to tell uh to tell about you yourself because being told by someone else it's always uh it's you know you're always at risk to be uh to be lied about or to be uh you know summarized in a way that's uh, uh you, you will feel like it's not enough or to be um uh to, to be folklorized like you know like uh, uh you, you will be an exotic part in the background of a uh, uh, of a greater uh story um so if you have like the uh the way to narrate yourself 
uh, then then of course there is a there is a freedom in uh, in that uh, and uh, and it's it's yeah it's a way to assert as well that you're not a secondary character in the background of uh, someone else's um, life and uh, that's very important as uh, as well yeah absolutely to being able to tell your own story i suppose i think we're about to open the floor to to um questions with the audience i just wanted to ask you one final question from myself are you working on on a next project already what are you working on now i'm working on a on an essay uh, about the um, about the place of uh, of fictions in our in our life uh, and uh, and yeah and more more or less about this uh, this debate that we have in France this uh, these days like um, uh, so some people freak out that uh, um, about what they call the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. and uh and and they think that uh that their opinions uh, are uh, confused like between what literature is and what moral is uh and you know like uh, when they say like this character cannot stay uh in this novel or in this movie because it it, it um conveys bad uh stereotypes or or these kind of things um and uh, and yeah, and so I, I'm just like okay, let's make a pause. Uh, let's think about what, why our relationship with characters is so important for once. Uh, you know, like uh, why do we actually have these very heated conversations about characters? What are they to us? Because they never existed, but they affect us so much. And uh, and what is the story of? Um, of uh, of heroes and uh, and the story of stories that make uh, you know that that can lead us to a fact that in France you had the nouveau roman uh, mm -hmm. so new novel saying like you know characters are dead uh, they don't exist anymore no one believe in them and at the same time you have like different groups saying like actually we want characters more like us we want characters that represent us and so you're like so what are they like are they dead since the 60s like Rob Grier said or are they like really alive and very important and supposed to represent us so yeah uh, it's I'm writing about that basically uh, and trying to make it uh, you know like a and understandable by uh, uh, everyone who didn't study semiology or narratology uh, and uh, and trying to make it fun I guess as well and accessible for sure. Yeah. That's wonderful. So I think we are handing it over to the audience now. Um, I'll let Miriam. Okay. Hello. So we have a question for Alice um, from Marie Hélène. Uh, she's asking if your books, uh, if your book, uh, if the art of losing has been distributed in Algeria yet and if so how was it received there it wasn't really distributed there uh and um uh in the sense that it was not republished by um by an algerian publisher so it means it's um uh you, you can buy it in algeria but it's very expensive and uh therefore it's quite you know uh excluding um but uh it has been uh, and it had and uh, it has not been translated into Arabic yet. So as well, you know, so it's in French and uh, very expensive. So you know, uh, uh, not for the bigger number. Um, but it has been read by uh, uh, several journalists and uh, and actually, yeah, it was it was more or less well received uh i would say so there was nothing uh there was nothing violent there was uh nothing aggressive which is weird because the the rhetoric of the government uh, and the hates of the state had been you know like so strong uh so strongly against what i was uh talking about and uh and the fact that the so-called harkis could uh could have uh yeah basically human dignity uh but yeah the, the newspaper where 
almost gentle, uh, even if they say that I missed the heroic part of uh, of the independence war by uh, staying in the in the gray zone. Like uh, uh, I, I forgot to uh, to show the real heroes, uh, but I wanted to forget the real heroes. So so it's uh, it's okay. Uh, we have another question by Grace, um, saying uh, she's uh, she's asking, would it be possible to name some of the authors and works that influence your the writing of the Art of Losing? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I well, actually, uh, the, the the two most important uh, are quoted in the book itself uh, because it's a. Uh, uh, Abdel Malek Sayad, uh, who wrote La Double Absence, and it's translated in English. It has another title quite different. I can't remember it. Uh, then, uh, then there was uh, Pierre Bourdieu uh, with uh, Algeria 60. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, a book by uh, Julia Fabiano about uh, about the transmission of memories in the in the Harkis communities in the south of France um, and uh, yeah and then you know like history history books uh, I uh, I read uh, I read a lot the work uh, of uh, Sylvie Teno and uh, and she was and she was nice enough to uh, to answer my uh, my emails as well when I had doubts questions or you know like a, Sometimes I would find a number that would change through all the articles uh, uh, that I would read and then uh, I would write to Sylvia and she would explain like, oh, it's normal because it has been like calculated this way or this way. Uh, so I felt, uh, uh, I felt safe, basically. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I was not terrified as I was when I started that I would write something that would be like completely completely false and I could, I could make a huge mistake in the in the middle of the book. We have another question by Anita Durant asking, uh, saying uh, how much of the novel is your own story, how much is fiction, could you quantify it and how was the book received by your family? Uh, I cannot quantify it, it's impossible uh, because uh, because that would mean sometime like uh, uh, drawing drawing the line in the middle of a sentence, like because like, you know uh, most of the sentence would be true, but uh, the adjective of color would be an invention, or most of the sentence would be uh, would be fake. But uh, the street the characters are in are you know actually have the place in my family story. So it's um, it's really yeah. It's really something I, I cannot do. And you have to add to that, that even the stories that were passed on in my family, some of them might be fictions. Uh, some, you know, like the, 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 even the things that, uh, and I, I didn't know much, but even the things that I thought I knew when I tried to verify them uh, against uh, the history books that I was finally reading, uh, they turned out to be really, spooky at least uh, so so the fiction is everywhere um, uh, under Anderson Tepper is asking has there been more written about history uh, uh, about the history of our case and the, the relationship to France recently or either in non-fiction or novels um, I don't know. Recently, I don't. Uh, recently, I yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm thinking I, of musulman. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking of musulman roman by um, who just just won the Prix Albertine. Uh, Zaya Ramani. Ah yeah, ah uh, yeah, but Zaya has been writing about it for uh, for a while now. But other than her, I don't really see. Yeah, I think maybe in like in on the history uh, book side, uh, I think it it might be uh, dealt with in uh, Raphael Branch's uh, new book. So, uh, Daddy, what have you done in Algeria? 
even if it's about uh, uh, the young Frenchmen who were uh, sent to uh, to Algeria during their uh, military service, I think that probably because they had to fight uh, with the, the Harkis. Uh, but I haven't read the, the book yet, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. So another, uh, just a, a remark from Ida Kumar saying, I read L'Art de Perdre with great interest. And a question from Katerina Pierre. In a general sense, I think Americans' understanding of French colonialism in Algeria is, I believe, somewhat limited. What do you What do you most hope that an American audience will gain from the novel? I guess. Uh, I guess what I hope from every uh, foreign novel that I read that suddenly my, uh, uh, you know, my view of the world gets uh, gets bigger. That some countries like really appear on uh, on my mental map and that I will feel related to to them uh, it will you know like uh, somehow I would say like this place it it's about me it concerns me like I have deep feelings uh, yeah attached to this to this place this city this street this country even if I've never been there uh, because uh, because I spent hours reading something and uh, and being with these characters and and now it, it's it's part of my story as well even if it has nothing to do with uh with my experience uh like recently uh, i read uh, the other half of the sun uh by uh, shimamanda ngozi adishie and suddenly i thought okay i will never forget about this war in nigeria i will never forget about the transitory existence of uh, of biafra like uh, I had read about it before, but it would, you know, like, uh, like it's not something I thought about. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, suddenly, yeah, suddenly this chapter of history is somehow mine uh, because I feel for, for the characters she created. Uh, and then, yeah, then my world uh, has become big, bigger than it was before I opened the, the book. And yeah. Uh, of course, it's kind of a, you know, it's a big hope, but <laughs> what I hope as a reader is the same thing that I hope as a writer, of course. Um, and so Ida, again, is asking, could you, uh, could you give us an idea of the meaning of the title? Why is losing an art? And can you contextualize a little bit? It's, uh, it's a quote, um, it's a quote from uh, One Art by uh, Elizabeth Bishop. And uh, it's a poem I really, it's a poem I really love, um, which says that the art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things uh, seem made with the intent of being lost, uh, etc. Et right, et right. It goes on, it, it's, uh, I love the fact that losing something which is, uh, you know, like which is badly seen in a in a in a society where competition is uh, at the root of so many of our social interactions. So losing it's terrible. Like you know, losing losing a game is terrible. Losing uh, losing a war is absolutely terrible. Like being a loser is a bad thing. And then you can just like, uh, you can try to change your way of, uh, of seeing that. You can say like losing is actually an art. There is an art, there is, an, there is a beauty in losing. Um, maybe some, some elegance, some dignity, some refined way of, uh, of doing things in, uh, in a minor um, tone. And, uh, and yeah. And that was really, really important for me because I was basically telling the story of a family that had like lost so, so many things, uh, the war, the country, uh, the, the house, and even the little things like the, the, the dresses, the, the jewelry, the, all the things that they, they left behind. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I wanted to say like, maybe, you know, Maybe it's 
it's what allows movement in the in the first place like you, you need to lose something to to go on maybe we can look at it in something else than uh, than pity or contempt we have uh, i'm going to group two questions from clara and albert nicolas uh, clara is asking uh, is it um, it's a pretty general question, but how do you build a character without making it stereo stereotypical? And how do you avoid the cliché? And Albert is asking, what is your discipline in writing a book? Um, I don't... Um, I don't really have a discipline. Um, it's a... Uh, I go with the flow uh it's it you know like it, it's not the same i i really think that it doesn't require the same thing at different time of the of the writing like when i'm in the very beginning of it and uh, everything is really blurry i just like i just write notes in a in a notebook uh, i can spend days or even weeks without thinking about uh, my project um then uh then then yeah, there, there will be a time where things get clearer and uh, and the urge gets stronger as well, uh, and uh, and then I, I start writing. But I'm a yeah I I'm a joyful writer. Like uh, I don't do things by discipline or because I have to or I don't write you know like in, in pain and this kind of thing. Like uh, uh, this is why I, say I don't have a discipline. Like I start writing with a. Uh, with writing the scenes that I want the most to write, like the one I'm, I'm the most excited about them, and so sometimes I don't even know where where they will be in the in the whole piece. Uh, you know, like maybe it will be in the middle, maybe it will be at, at the end. Um, it's just like I really want to write a scene with that uh, uh, that element in it. I really want to write a scene with this character. Uh, sometimes I don't, yeah, I don't know who the character is uh, exactly neither. It's just uh, I, I want like to write a specific speech or a specific action because something excites me in the, in the challenge of writing that. Uh, and when I don't feel like writing, I don't write. So I don't really have, yeah, I go walking in the, in the woods. Um, so I'm a happy writer. Um, and how do I create a character? It really depends on the on the character. Like for example, uh, like like you know when what we talked about with Danit, like the, the the three parts are so different uh, that it I I can't create the character in the same way. Like Ali is so foreign from me in the first time that I cannot I cannot start uh, his character by you know like by asking myself. What does he think about it? How does he feel about that? I cannot picture what he feels and what he thinks. I need to create him from the outside. So, you know, asking myself, okay, uh, what is the place he lives in? How are the mountains? How do you feed yourself in these mountains? What is the village? What is the hierarchy in the village? What is the rhythm of, um, of a day when, or, or, or a year? Uh, a season when uh, you live from uh, uh, the olive trees. How do you make oil? Uh, you know, how does it how does it smell? How do you dress to do this kind of uh, of uh, culture? And uh, and then when I have all these data, maybe I can think. Okay, so if I add this point to this point, then um, uh, then then uh, then I start. Yeah, I, I start understanding. I don't know what time means for Ali, what love means for Ali, and war, and peace, and uh, uh, and yeah, they don't have the same meaning that they have for me, for Naima, or for, or for Hamid, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I'd really say like it's, uh, it's, it's always a different, uh, uh, a different problem how I build a, a character. And I don't always, uh, I don't always try to run away from the cliches. Uh, like I think it was Borges who said that cliches are cliches for a good reason. That at first they were such a good idea that everyone wanted to use them. Um, and uh, 
yeah and uh, so i i like to keep i don't know i like to keep some of some of them and just to reframe it uh, to, you know like if i uh, uh if i change this word of this word and we can look at it in a in a new way uh, then maybe we can wonder why why this thing sticked you know why we used it so much that it became a cliche And I have another question by Beatrice Rockestein. Um, where you were you influenced um yeah, were you influenced by Algerian authors like Boalem Sansal, Kamel Daoud, Yasmina Kadra? And uh, yeah, and Beatrice says that she, she has greatly uh, appreciated the uh, the art of losing. Um so thank you. <laughs> First, uh, and then I wouldn't say that I was influenced by them. I read them, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, of course, like you know, yeah, I read them but in the same way, you know, like uh, uh, in the same way I read uh, I read Camus, uh, I read uh, Asia Jebar, I, so uh, I read basically uh, uh, everyone that I could uh, uh, that I could read was written about Algeria without um without treating the the arabs like uh, like uh, this uh, background exotic elements we were talking about like you know uh not using them as palm trees or or, or camels uh, just something that says like we are in algeria but actually we're going to tell you the story of a french family living here in algiers and uh, and so on um but uh, yeah i uh I don't know if I if I was influenced by them, and by that I mean I don't recall stealing from them deliberately. So so I don't know. And a last question by Clara saying, if you do, um, if you could give an advice to a, a, a would be writer, what would it be? <laughs> ah, that one is always a tricky one. Um, The um, yeah, I think the 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 most basic one, uh, like write, uh, uh, write as much as you as you can because uh, from my experience, some things you can always you can only learn from writing. Thinking about the writing, like having good ideas, um, won't show you how you know like wh what problems appear in a paragraph or in a sentence and that only the writing can create and only the writing can solve so you need to to write as as much as uh, as you can and um and to try to finish things as well uh because in in the same way i think that you can uh, um you can work in a in a better way on something that is uh, that has you know like a more or less a beginning and an end like you can rethink the whole piece as a piece and so it's always uh, it's always good to try to uh, to finish something even if you feel like uh, i don't know like uh, the inspiration is gone I, I really don't believe in inspiration so I, I think like if you think inspiration is gone it's it's it's, it's okay uh, because uh, it's still you you can still write uh, you can still work you can still finish the piece and uh, and probably you should and then the second advice is to to read uh, and to be a very curious reader uh, and uh, to read different different shapes, different uh, genre, different uh, uh, yeah, different pieces of work. Because sometimes we think that a, a novel or any piece of writing should be like this or this because we have only met pieces of writing which were built like this and this and this, and then suddenly we meet a piece of writing which does things differently. And, uh, and the limits we had, so the preconceptions that we had of what a novel is or what a poem is or what a play is, it's just like, a, it's shattered by, uh, by this meeting. So, so reading yeah, helps a great deal to, uh, uh, to write more freely, I think. And we have a last question from David Bell, uh, who has 
attended some lecture on Algerian literature at the Alliance Française here in New York. And these lectures were given by an Algerian professor. And the professor listed you as a modern Algerian author of expression française. Um, and in this category, there were also Ferraoun, Kadra, and other writers. What, what's your reaction? How do you react to that? What is your reaction? <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not an Algerian writer. Uh, how could I be? You know, like a, um, I, uh, I didn't grow up there. Uh, I. I don't have the nationality, so I'm not officially uh, Algerian at all. Um, and uh, yeah, and my everyday, my everyday experience is uh, is French. Even my uh, my relationship to my uh, to my language is is from a French woman to French language. Uh, it's not uh, um, it's it's not like. You know, I, I cannot ask myself like uh, like uh, many uh, many Algerian writers do. You know, like what does it mean for me if I write in French uh, because it was the language of the the colonizers? You know, like uh, should I do it? How will it be perceived? It's like for me, it's I, I have no choice. Uh, I have no choice. No choice, and it's uh, uh, and, and it doesn't convey any peculiar uh, meaning. So I don't think the expression fits to describe me or my work. And I have, sorry, I have a very last question from Anita, who said, uh, she, I, I think maybe I, sk I skipped her question. She was asking, how did your family receive the novel? Oh, um, uh, you know what? I stopped answering this, uh, this question in France, uh, but, uh, um, I answered it during the first few months, so uh, because it's my first American uh, appearance, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it and then I will stop. Um, my uh, uh, my family was uh, uh, my family was happy and moved about the novel uh, for a part of it uh, because. Uh, because a part of my family still doesn't read, uh, my grandmother, my grandmother still doesn't read, uh, and a part of my family reads but doesn't have in his cultural habits to read 500 pages novel. So they know that the thing exists, but they will never, never read it. Um, and uh, and 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 so it's a weird, it's a weird thing. Like you know, I, I know I uh, I took from. Uh, I took some stories, I, uh, I reshaped them, and, uh, and of course I wanted to be able to, to give them back uh, as new stories that we can uh, run through the, the family. But I know as well that I chose, uh, I, I, I chose a way to do so that will exclude uh, many members of my family. This is why I actually can't wait for the, uh, for the book to be uh, turned into, into a movie because it's, it's easier uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, uh, it, it's easier to see a movie. It will be shared with, a, uh, you know, by uh, so many people in the projects that will never, never read the 500 pages book. I think we 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 it's time to 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 end this conversation. Thank you so 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 much, Alice and Danit, for this wonderful conversation. It was so interesting, so rich. Thank you for your generosity, your time. Um, we can't wait to welcome you here in Abertin, in in real among the among the books uh, in our walls. Um, maybe Sandrine will want to say a word. It, it was really a truly a pleasure. Um, Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure for me too, and I, I apologize for, uh, of course, the many mistakes that I made in English. Uh, I hope I was uh, uh, understandable through through the whole conversation. It was perfect. It was really perfect. It was so fluid. Uh, thank you for for doing the effort of speaking in English. It's not uh, it's not easy. <laughs> you know what we're talking about. <laughs> Euh, merci, 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 merci beaucoup, merci infiniment. Euh, 